Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Planetarium show. My name is Jessica. I'm the director of the Planetarium, and our voice on the sky tonight is uh, one of our students who you sometimes see and sometimes don't, but I will let him introduce himself. Hi there. My name is Eli. I'm a physics and astronomy student at UMD. So tonight is the next segment in our exploration series, and we're going to take a deep dive into space junk. Um, kind of a silly thing you might think to, to talk about and look at, but there's some really cool stuff. And, um, you know, a, a lot that we have learned about just the origins of our solar system from all of this space junk. Um, so as I get set up, uh, as always, if you have any questions throughout the show tonight, uh, feel free to put them down in the comments. Eli is going to keep an eye on that for me and will let me know when those questions come up. Otherwise, we will also have time at the end for questions as well. All right, well, let's get to it. Let's talk space junk. So... All of the things we're going to talk about are things that we find within our solar system, um, but they can be found uh, in other star systems out there, but we're focusing on our own. And a lot of times when you just say solar system, what people tend to think of is the sun and planets and maybe even moons. But there's a lot more in our solar system than just the sun, planets, and moons. Uh, so you can see here, this is a lot of different objects um, than just those few that, that we just mentioned. Um, there is a lot of kind of smaller rocky objects, small icy objects. Some of those things come close to the sun, some of them come close to Earth. And so what we're going to be doing tonight is taking a look at all of these other things that fill up our solar system. Uh, and that's what we have dubbed our space junk. Um, so these are things like asteroids, comets, and meteoroids. And we're going to take a close-up look at what all of these things are. But just to get us started, I want to give some very basic definitions. So a comet is an icy object that uh, has a orbit or a path that brings it close to the sun. An asteroid is just a rocky fragment in space. And a meteoroid is a tiny fragment. So we're talking like the size of a grain of sand um, or the size of like a dust. Um, so not big like asteroids, but tiny little grains that are peppered all throughout the solar system. Um, now, there are a couple of other terms on here too, meteor and meteorite. Those are actually different objects, but they kind of represent what the object is doing. So meteoroids are the tiny little grains that are in space. When they fall through the Earth's atmosphere and shine bright, that streak of light that we see is called a meteor. And then if that object is strong enough to survive the fall through the atmosphere and hits the ground, then it's called a meteorite. So a meteoroid is while it's in space, meteor is as it is falling through the atmosphere, and meteorite is as it hits the ground. Um, so, like I said, we're going to go into a lot more uh, in-depth on all of this, and we're actually going to start with asteroids. So, um, this was actually something I had thought about bringing up, Eli, when you were talking on Wednesday about the spacing between the planets. Um, but I figured that I, I would save it and just, just talk about it tonight. Um, but if you were with us on Wednesday um, in our, uh, what was that, Scale and Wonders of the Universe, I think is what we called it. Um, one of the things Eli talked about was kind of the, the distances to the planets and the spacing between the planets. And you see a lot of patterns in that. Um, when we look at the four inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, they're all about one and a half times further from the sun than the previous object. Uh, and then when we get out to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, um, we see that each of the successive planet is about two times further than the one previous. But there's this weird gap in between Mars and Jupiter. And the distance between Mars and Jupiter doesn't fit uh, any of these patterns. And so early astronomers actually thought that there must be something there 
in between Mars and Jupiter in order for the pattern for the spacing between the planets to be to really make sense as a whole. Uh, and so they started looking for something that lives between Mars and Jupiter to explain this unusual gap in between the planets by saying, hey, there, there's actually another planet there. One of the people tasked with this was um, an Italian uh, priest named uh, Giuseppe Piazzi, who actually discovered an object in between Mars and Jupiter. Um, this is the object he found, and we can now call it Ceres. And keep in mind that these things are small. Um, so they're even harder to see than like the planets that you may have looked at through a telescope. They really are just tiny little points of light that as you watch them from night to night, which this is like a, a compilation of many, many nights worth of, of observations, you see it slowly move across the background stars. And it's that movement that tells us that it's within our own solar system. And if we can get the exact how fast it's moving, we can even tell you exactly how far away from the sun it is. But this is what uh, Piazzi saw. And he actually discovered it on January 1st, 1801. So great way to bring in that new year. Uh, but he saw this object and they thought, great, we have found our missing planet. Ceres is the planet that's supposed to be there between Mars and Jupiter. Everything makes sense. Fantastic. The problem is, after that point, we started finding even more objects in between Mars and Jupiter. And these objects, Ceres included, are quite small. So you can see here a comparison between the size of the moon and the size of the first 10 of these objects that were found in between Mars and Jupiter. The first one, Ceres, was the largest, which makes sense that it was the first to be found because it's it's the biggest, so it's going to be the easiest to see. But these are all much, much, much smaller than our moon. Definitely not what we would consider planet size. And they started finding lots of them. By the time that we had, uh, I believe, about 60 or so of these objects found, astronomers had to go, okay, hold up. These aren't all planets. We can't call them planets. And that's when they ended up reclassifying them as asteroids. Um, that name picked because um, that, that prefix ASTR is, um, I think it's Latin for star. And they do look like they're star-like and they're, they're tiny little points of light that move across the sky. Uh, and so that's, that's how we discovered the, the asteroids in our solar system. And if this sounds familiar, that's because this is exactly what happened to Pluto when we reclassified it from a planet to a dwarf planet. It was the first one we found, then we found lots of others, and we reclassified. That's what science does. We continue to grow and evolve our, our classification, our understanding of the universe as we get more and more data. So, um, yeah, Ceres first was planet, then we found lots of other things, and we renamed all of those objects asteroids. So asteroids come in quite a range of shapes and sizes. Um, here are some other asteroids. Uh, we saw previously that you know Ceres looks kind of nice, spherical. Um, some of the other ones that were found right after are spherical-ish. They're getting to look a bit more lumpy. But then as we look at really small asteroids, they become much more irregular in shape. Um, really, an asteroid is just a, a rocky object that's not a planet. So much smaller, um, irregular shaped, rocky, the, the exact type of rock that makes them up uh, kind of varies, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but they do range in size from a couple thousand kilometers in size for the largest asteroid um, down to a couple meters in size. So here's kind of the range in uh, size of asteroids. And we can see that there are many, many, many more small asteroids than there are large. So there are very few big ones and lots and lots of little ones. All right, so most asteroids are found in between Mars and Jupiter in a region that we call the asteroid belt. 
And so the asteroids that live in the asteroid belt are known as main belt asteroids. Uh, but not all asteroids live in the asteroid belt. Some asteroids have orbits that bring them into the solar system, into the inner solar system. If they cross the orbit of Mars, they're known as Amor asteroids. If they cross the orbit of Mars and Earth, they're known as Apollo asteroids. Um, and then we also have some asteroids that go out into the outer solar system. Those asteroids that have orbits that take them out into the outer solar system are known as centaurs. And then you also notice that Jupiter here has a little collection of asteroids that kind of follow it around uh, its orbit around the sun. And this collection of asteroids that Jupiter has are called the Trojan asteroids. All right. Um, so as I had mentioned, um, asteroids do come in a couple of different varieties as far as what exactly they're made of. And that's one of the ways that we can classify asteroids is based off of what they're made of. So the most common type of asteroid that we have found are C-type asteroids. And they're named that because they are rich in carbon compounds. Um, including things like amino acids. Uh, because they are rich in carbon and carbon compounds, they're much darker in color, which makes them harder for us to see from here on Earth. Um, they also can have uh, a lot of kind of hydrated minerals, so uh, minerals that have um, water locked in them. Um, as I said, these are the most common type of asteroids that we find. About 75% of the asteroids that we know of are C-type. And these are predominantly located in the outer asteroid belt. So more out here in the outer edges of the asteroid belt. Our second most common type are S-type asteroids. Um, S for silicate or rocky stone um, so these are rich in just silicates, which are you know, rocky uh, components. Um, these make up about 17% of the known asteroids, and these are predominantly found in the inner asteroid belt. So in the inner parts, we have predominantly S-type, and in the outer parts, we have predominantly C-type. Um, now, after this, there are lots of kind of specialty subtypes um, that are quite rare. Um, one of those uh, that's the most common of these specialty types, I know this picture is just lovely, isn't it? Uh, getting pictures of asteroids is difficult. They're small and far away. Um, but the, the other type of asteroid that I want to bring up, because we're going to kind of come back to this in a little bit, um, is an M-type asteroid, which is a metal-rich asteroid. So it has a lot of metals, um, of nickel and iron metals and metal compounds within it. Um, and these are actually the third most common type of asteroid that's out there. All right. Um, so where did these asteroids come from? Um, a common hypothesis uh, long ago, before we had a good understanding of the formation of the solar system and stuff, was that these are actually the, the fragments of a bigger object, a planet that did used to live between Mars and Jupiter and then got smashed to bits. Uh, we now know that that's not the case. It's actually more of the opposite. These are leftover pieces from the planet formation process that just didn't become a planet. Now, most of these leftover bits actually aren't here anymore. Most of them got flung out of the solar system because of interactions with the big planets like Jupiter. So the asteroids that we still see here are just those that didn't go into a planet but also didn't get slung out by Jupiter. They're about the about 1% of what was originally here uh, that wasn't cleared out by Jupiter. Um, and so yeah, that's where the asteroids are. They're really just the building blocks of the planets. And that's one of the reasons we're so interested in studying them and understanding them, because these are the pieces that built the planets. And by understanding what pieces were available, we can start to fill in that picture of how do we go from, you know, a small 
asteroid up to a giant planet like the Earth or an even bigger planet like Jupiter? You know, how, how do we make that happen? What components were there to make it out of? Um, and, and all of that. And so it really helps us to kind of piece together exactly how planets form. All right, um, so moving on from asteroids, uh, let's talk about comets. So comets have been known to exist since antiquity. I mean, we see accounts of people who saw these like hairy stars or these stars with tails um, in their sky. And a lot of times for um, early cultures, comets were often seen as uh, bad omens. Um, now, by the time of about Aristotle, um, it was thought that comets were actually uh, disturbances in Earth's atmosphere. Uh, and this was widely taught by Aristotle, um, mostly because uh, the way he taught about the universe was everything past Earth um, was part of the heavens and therefore had to be perfect and unchanging. And so for this uh, apparition, for this appearance of this, this comet that is a change, things can only change in the realm of Earth. So these had to exist within Earth's atmosphere in order for it to fit kind of his ideology of, of how the universe works. Um, but fast forward a few thousand years, we have another famous astronomer, Tycho Brahe, who realized that these comets could not be within Earth's atmosphere. He was actually able to figure out how far away they were, or at least be able to show that they were much further away than the moon. And that's what we're actually seeing here on the right, is um, a page from one of Tycho Brahe's um, uh, publications, one of his books. And he shows um, how he was able to figure out that the comet lies much further away than the moon and had to be in the realm of the heavens, which of course toppled things there. Subtle, that's a whole other show. And maybe I will do that because I kind of love talking about that, the kind of revolution of um, the heliocentric model. Um, I'm not going to ramble too much on that tonight. Um, so with that, we did kind of learn that the, these are objects uh, past the Earth, not within our atmosphere, uh, within our solar system. Um, so taking a close-up look at comets, the actual physical object itself, which we call the nucleus of the comet, is uh, kind of similar in shape and size to asteroids. They're small, lumpy, irregularly shaped, uh, kind of come in similar size range to like the smaller asteroids. Um, but instead of being rocky or metal, uh, comets have a lot of ice mixed in with them. So they're really like a, a dirty snowball, a mix of rock and ice. And so uh, what ends up giving them that spectacular appearance is that ice that's a part of it. Because, of course, when you take ice and you get it close to the sun, that ice starts to melt and vaporize. And you can see that on these close-up images we've gotten of some of these comet nuclei. You can see where that ice is vaporizing and kind of creating these jets that are blasting off of the nucleus of the comet. And so once the comet is close to the sun, it takes on the appearance that we most uh, are familiar with. Um, so the actual physical piece is that nucleus that's embedded in there. It's surrounded by uh, this gas that's being vaporized by the heat of the sun, uh, which creates what we call the coma. And then coming off the end, or off of it, are two tails, the gas tail and the dust tail. And here's an actual comet, so you can see the dust tail and the gas tail. So the gas tail is the gas that's being vaporized off the nucleus that is being pushed back and away from the sun by the solar wind, the steady stream of charged particles. Um, and then the dust tail are little pieces of dust that are also getting blown off the comet nucleus by those jets of gas. Um, you know, it just, it just kind of puffs and blows some dust off with it. And that stuff is also getting pushed back by, by sunlight and the solar wind, and that creates this dust tail. Um, since the dust is a little bit heavier, 
Uh, that's why you can kind of sometimes see them separate and you end up with two distinct tails. Now, a lot of people um, assume that these tails must be uh, due to the motion of the comet itself. And that's not the case. These tails happen because of the sun. So these tails don't point along the direction of the comet's path. They actually always point away from the sun. And so we can see here the kind of typical um, cycle of what happens as the comet um, comes in to the sun. It starts, uh, the closer it gets, the hotter it gets. Those ices start to vaporize. As it gets even closer, we get close enough for the sun to start pushing that gas and dust out and away, creating that gas and dust tail. Um, it swings around where we see it in its kind of biggest, brightest in all of its glory. And then as it starts to move back away, those things shut back down and we kind of stop really being able to see it. Because uh, the actual physical nucleus, the object, um, is quite small. And the only reason we can see it when it's close to the sun is because all of that gas and dust surrounding it make it much bigger and give more area for light to bounce off of. So it makes it appear bigger and brighter than the actual physical nucleus is. All right. Um, so when we talk about comets, sorry, I didn't mean to hit my headphones there. Um, we put them into two categories based off of the period of their orbits, the amount of time it takes for them to orbit around the sun. Um, short period comets are comets that have an orbital period less than 200 years. So they take less than 200 years to orbit the sun. And almost all of these objects, these short period comets, appear to come from a region called the Kuiper Belt. Um, the Kuiper Belt is a lot like the Asteroid Belt, um, but it's uh, icy remains from the formation of the planets that is out past Neptune. Um, so this is icy debris left over that didn't get incorporated into the planets and also survived any interactions with the planets and didn't get flung out of the solar system. Um, and so short period comets appear to come from the Kuiper Belt. Um, now the other type, oops, oh no, that is the right one. The other type are long period comets, uh, which have orbital periods greater than 200 years. And based off of um, all of the long period comets, uh, we think that these must come from a kind of reservoir of icy objects that lives extremely far away, kind of the outer reaches of the sun's gravitational influence. And we call this region the Oort Cloud. So it's this roughly spherical distribution of icy objects. And we only know of its existence or I got jump scared with my headphones. This happens way too often. One sec. Okay. Um, we, we only know of its existence because of the existence of long period comets. Um, it's basically, we see these long period comets, they have to come from somewhere. Based off of the characteristics, we think that there is this Oort cloud. Um, and this is probably icy objects that initially got flung out from the region of the Kuiper Belt, from around kind of the planets, but they weren't flung out of the solar system fast enough to fully escape the sun's gravity. So they now just exist in these huge orbits on the very outer edges of the sun's gravitational pull. And uh, occasionally some of them get flung into the solar system by gravitational interactions with passing stars. Um, yeah, we're, this Oort cloud extends to about a light year out. Um, and that is starting to get in the realm of stars. Uh, so when stars pass close by, um, their gravity disturbs some of these objects in the Oort cloud and they get flung into the inner solar system and we get long period comets. All right, so the last bit of space junk that we wanna talk about are meteoroids. 
Um, now remember that we have a couple of different names for these objects depending on where they are. Right, the meteoroid is the object in space. The meteor is that flash of light as it falls through the atmosphere. And the meteorite is anything that survives that fall through the atmosphere and hits the ground. Now when it comes to meteors, what you're probably most familiar with are meteor showers. And those are all thanks to comets. As comets make their path, uh, make their um, pass by the sun, and the uh, ices get vaporized, and all that gas and dust is getting blown off of the nucleus, that leaves a trail of debris behind. And when Earth passes through that trail of debris, we get a lot of pieces of dust left behind from the comet falling through our atmosphere all at the same time, and that creates what we call meteor showers. Um, most meteor showers are named after, or no, not most, all meteor showers are named after what we call the radiance. So if you were to watch the meteors during a meteor shower, um, they all seem to point back to the same place in the sky, which is the radiance. Um, and so in this case, uh, these all appear to come from uh, an area of the sky in near the constellation of Gemini. So we call this the Geminids, uh, the Geminid meteor shower, because that's where the meteors appear to originate from. Um, that's what we're seeing. When we have a meteor shower, that's just us passing through a debris trail left behind by a comet. Now, meteor showers are not the only times that you can see meteors. In fact, if you have a dark sky, you can go out and see a couple of meteors every night. You don't have to have a meteor shower. Um, now, while the meteor shower is due to um, comets, the kind of sporadic meteors that you can see on any given night aren't necessarily due to comet dust. In fact, uh, when we trace back the kind of trajectory of these sporadic uh, meteors, a lot of them actually come from the asteroid belt. And in fact, any meteor that we have seen that has survived the fall through the atmosphere and hits the ground, so it becomes a meteorite. Every single one of those is traced back to the asteroid belt. And that's because rock is more durable than ice, right, and, and dust. Um, so the things that come from comets just can't survive the fall through the atmosphere, they burn up, whereas these bits from the asteroid belt are a bit sturdier and they can actually survive the fall through the atmosphere and hit the ground and become meteorites. So all of the meteorites that we have here on Earth come from the asteroid belt. Well, almost all. We have a few that we think have actually come from Mars and the Moon, um, but most of the meteorites that we have that have hit the Earth have come from the asteroid belt. So when we take a look at these meteorites, we see that they come in different compositions that actually match the composition of the asteroids. We have iron-rich meteorites, we have stony meteorites, and then we have stony iron meteorites, uh, where these are like a mix of stone and iron. Um, when it comes to stony, the uh, stony meteorites actually come in two different types. Um, we have chondrite, stony chondrites. These are really rich in carbon compounds. Um, this one, uh, from the IND, I have to show it off because, well, I have to. Um, I actually have a piece of it. I have a piece of the IND uh, meteorite that my husband got for me because it's amazing and I get to touch it now, which I couldn't do in the museum. Um, and then the uh, chondrites, stony chondrites, are the other type. Um, and these actually match the uh, asteroid types that we talked about. So the con stony chondrites are the uh, like the C-type asteroids. The iron meteorites are like the M-type asteroids. And the stony achondrites are like the S-type 
asteroids. And so these meteorite fragments actually help us learn about the asteroids without having to go to them ourselves because we have pieces of them. And they've helped show us kind of how the asteroids and how these fragments that built the solar system, um, how they evolved and changed from the very beginning to today. And so these C-type asteroids, which these uh, stony chondrites come from, are really pristine pieces of rock from the very, very beginnings of the solar system. These are some of the first solid pieces that formed in our solar system, which again is why I'm so excited to have this. Um, this is literally a piece of one of the very first things that formed in our solar system, and it's mine, and I get to touch it, and I love it. Um, whereas these other types show us that not all of these pieces stayed small. Some of these pieces were able to grow really, really big and get so big and so hot that they actually melted and went through a process that we call differentiation. So basically when you have a bunch of different material and it all becomes liquid, the dense stuff sinks to the center and the lower density stuff rises to the surface. And that's what we're seeing here in these type of meteorites. We're seeing iron meteorites come from the core of an object that got big enough and hot enough to differentiate into core mantle crust. And so what must have happened is it got big enough to, to do this, and then later on it got shattered. A really big collision broke it up into pieces, and with these iron meteorites, we are now seeing pieces of the core of what used to be a much bigger object. Um, these stony achondrites come from kind of the mantle and crust of what once was this big object, and these stony irons, which are also called palisites, kind of come from the boundary between the core and the crust. Um, so these are really showing us what kind of processes took place. And this is a stage that all of the planets went through as well. So it's showing us really a dissected planet um, that didn't turn into a planet. And so it's showing us kind of what uh, materials went in to make our core and mantle and crust. Um, so a lot of really cool things there. Um, now, one of the reasons we really wanted to do this show um, now is because we do have a pretty big meteor shower coming up in a couple of weeks, the Perseids. Now, you know, they're called the Perseids because they seem to originate from an area of sky around the Perseus constellation. Um, the Perseids are actually currently going on. Um, they have been going on since about July 17th and will go on through about August 24th. But the peak, so when you're going to see the most meteors in the night, happens around uh, the 12th or 13th. Um, so if you can head out uh, early morning after midnight, uh, you could see tens to maybe even 100 meteors an hour, depending on your viewing conditions. Um, the moon is not going to be too much of a problem, especially that late. Um, at night, it's not going to be up anymore, so we'll have a pretty dark sky. Uh, so super excited for the Perseids. And that's actually um, why we planned our dark sky caravan to be on that week of the peak so that we could be out in dark locations uh, and kind of enjoy the meteor shower with everyone as we also have our telescopes out looking at some other objects as well. Um, so I'm going to wrap up there. Um, this is, again, uh, another edition of our exploration series where we kind of just take a deep dive into a specific topic. Um, we've done a lot of fun stuff so far with it, everything from uh, individual planets to black holes and dark matter. Uh, so if there's anything you'd like for us to cover in this exploration series, let us know. Because obviously we want to do shows on topics that you're interested in. All right, I will stop it there. Any questions, Eli? Nope, no questions. All right. 
Well, um, if anyone does have any questions, now is a great time to leave them down in the comments. Um, and while I give that a second, I'm just going to show off something that has been months in the making and finally went live yesterday. Um, so some of you may know, um, I've teased this in the past, or maybe you saw our announcement yesterday, um, that we have been working on what we call an all-sky camera up at a really dark location up the Gunflint Trail at the Chickwalk Museum and Nature Center. Um, this is a camera that basically takes a 360 degree picture of the sky. And uh, we went live with it yesterday. Um, so you can go to this website, which is linked in the video description, um, and see live views from the camera. Now the camera doesn't run all day. Um, it's only set to run from about 30 minutes before sunset to 30 minutes after sunrise. So really just capturing kind of nighttime. Um, but during that time frame, if you refresh this page, which is not going to do anything because we're not in that time frame yet, it'll show you the current view from the camera. Now, after each night session, it also puts together a time lapse video. Um, so this is last night, our first night being live with it. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have the best weather uh, for going live. Um, you can see we definitely get uh, some clouds. They got some rain up there. Uh, I know the smoke has been really bad again. Um, but on the YouTube channel that this is posted on, there's also um, some archives of uh, previous night's uh, time lapses as we've kind of been testing this over the past several months. Um, I do think it's really cool that you can kind of see lightning flashes throughout the night. Definitely not what we really want to be seeing, but I still think it's really cool. You can see the rain on it. Um, so yeah, uh, we are so excited about this. Um, we also give everyone access to uh, all of the images that have been taken, uh, all of the time lapse videos that have been taken, give you some more information about the camera itself. Um, so we are just very, very excited for this to, to finally be live. Um, I've kind of been working on this in the background for well over a year now. Um, and it's, it's finally out there. Um, you can also find the camera itself has a Facebook page that uh, I linked to on the planetarium's page. If you want to go follow it, it'll give you like updates and stuff. Um, so yeah, just, just a promo for our, our camera. Um, and we already are working on the next stage, actually. Um, we have a second camera that we are going to place uh, in Duluth so that we can really compare uh, truly dark skies versus our light polluted skies that we have here in the city um, and kind of get some good examples um, and comparisons of, of what a difference it makes. Um, all right. Any questions? I'm not seeing any. No, oh, no questions. Okay. Well, I guess we will wrap it up there. Um, next week is uh, August, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, so we will be doing our customary beginning of the month shows. So Wednesday will be What's Up um, August edition, and Saturday will be the August Constellation story time. And then after that is our Dark Sky Caravan, which is going to be a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, thanks for joining us tonight. We hope you had fun looking at this kind of deep dive into all of the debris in our solar system. Um, a lot of cool stuff there. And uh, have a wonderful rest of your weekend, and we will see you next time. Bye, everyone.